Welcome to the Thought Leadership Podcast, where we share insights on how you can become the go-to thought leader in your niche. I'm your host, Alejandro Sanoja, founder and personal branding consultant at Latin Presauros, and today our guest is Sandra Clark. Sandra Clark is a trainer and coach specializing in providing LinkedIn consulting and training. Through her company, LinkedIn Mentoring, Sandra offers coaching services for individuals, teams, and companies to help busy professionals build their online brand and showcase their expertise by creating great profiles on LinkedIn. She understands the finer points of LinkedIn technology, is able to demystify and break down its concept into consumable pieces, and teaches steps that can be implemented immediately so her clients get noticed and get results. Well, Sandra, I've been excited about this conversation since I started doing research and preparation for it. I have a ton of questions that I want to ask you, but uh, something that caught my attention is the way you describe what you do. You say social media for the socially reluctant. Who is the socially reluctant and why do you name them that? Um Thank you for asking that. This is such a fun thing to share with people. I started using that term quite a few years ago, but I had it kind of hidden. If you started to read about me, I, I put it in there and people were entertained by it. And what I originally thought it would be is more age-based, people who are a little older that were uncomfortable about being on LinkedIn, this modern social media. Now it doesn't seem modern at all. And then of recent times, I decided these are so much the people I'm talking to, I'm going to lead with that. So I put it right up front in my headline. And I've had so many great conversations that have started since I've done that, that I have really enjoyed it. But it turned out it's nothing to do with age. It's so many reasons why people are uncomfortable putting themselves out there on LinkedIn, sometimes because it's generational. But I work with a lot of younger people, you know, all those wonderful, smart engineers in Silicon Valley where I live. It's just like, oh, don't make me promote myself, put myself online. I just want to geek out in front of my computer and you're making me talk about myself and I'm so private and that's uncomfortable. So it's all ages. It's more personality type. And it turns out to be so many people. Sometimes it's just people feel like they don't want to brag um, or they uh, they don't know what people will think. Um, so it might be for some people, they technically find it difficult to know what to hit, what to click, what to do on LinkedIn. But most of the time, it's like a psychological approach um, to put themselves out there on LinkedIn. So that's now become something I lead with. You know, I have a prominently on my website and on my LinkedIn profile. And I, when I do talks and webinars, I always mention that. It always gets a smile. It does. And it's a great point. I love it how you have it there at the beginning because it did. It caught my attention. I was like, wow, this is such a, a great way to um, create a tribe for the people that you want to help. So I totally love that. And something else, we're going to talk a lot more about LinkedIn and, and many of the things you mentioned. But before we do that, I want to take a detour because it also in preparation for our conversation, I read your bio, your story, and it, there's a lot in there. There's kibbutz in Israel, hitchhiking, living in Thailand, scuba diving, paradise, acting in theater, directing, and much more. And it's so well crafted in the way it ends and you connect it at the end and i think a lot of people get the their story wrong right there's a people do it maybe in a way to being too promotional and too much about their accomplishments and maybe there's another extreme where it's too much about their life and not really about what they can do for the potential client that's read their, their bio um, I think you did an amazing job. I suspect it has something to do with your experience in theater, but I would like to learn a little bit more about the process that you took towards writing that story. Is that something that you've been changing through the years? Did you use kind of like a hero's journey mentality to, to write that? Tell me more about how you wrote that, please. 
<laughs> okay. So it's um, it's evolved over time because before it's just like, well, people don't want to know about me. They don't care about me. They just, you know, want to know what I'm going to do for them. So I, I didn't have much of anything about me. People asked me, it wasn't particularly private. It's just, I don't think people are interested. And then over time, I learned that, uh, you know, because a part of my brand is about being gentle, about making people feel comfortable so that they feel comfortable to expose their insecurities to me. And uh, so I can help support them to become more confident. And um, so that sharing some of that gave us something to talk about, a point of commonality. And again, I've tried to become more playful over the years. And part of being playful is to share some of my crazy background. So a lot of the things for me in self-promotion are about what's your purpose? So my purpose is to connect with people and to make people feel more comfortable with me. So there's almost nothing somebody else has done that I haven't already done, good, bad, and ugly. Um, so it's okay, it's a safe place. So it has evolved somewhat and that being playful publicly is actually still a barrier for me. And so I've been pushing myself to share a little more about myself to be that kind of playful. I like the idea in theory, but darn, it's hard to do in reality. It is, it is. And then as you were evolving that story, what were some of the measurements that you were using to gauge if you were going in the right direction with it? I wish it was as thoughtful as measuring. <laughs> it's more like if somebody says to me, oh, I read that. Did you go there? Did, did you? I didn't know you'd done that. How interesting. If they mentioned they saw it and they felt a sense of connection with it, I count that as a success. Um, I'm not deeply analytical. I just kind of try things. I put it out there. If people respond well, then, okay, I have a winner. And sometimes, no. I'll be honest, I... I put some things out there and I do it quickly because it's still scary to me. And so it's like, a, I put it out there and then I run away so that, you know, it's done. I don't second guess myself. So <laughs> I'll be honest. I'm very much like my clients. It's uncomfortable for me. No, it's a great point. And I do think that there's definitely a lot of those elements that you were mentioning there. Cause I was, I wanted to know, and it's in the right amount because I think sometimes, yes, you do have to share about yourself, but if you share too much, then I, I feel like people might not want to necessarily continue reading because they felt you you lost them. But I wanted to know so much about all those adventures. And I was like, I want to ask her about this and this and this. And then in the end, you close everything in, in focusing in the professional endeavor. So um, anybody listening to this, you have to go and read Sandra's story because it is uh, amazing, well-crafted, and it's going to give you an idea of what a good bio looks like. So with that said, Sandra, we've talked about um, the socially reluctant. We've talked about bios, and I want to go deeper into LinkedIn profile optimization, which I know you do great. So I thought it would be a good idea to start with what are, if we were to divide and create three tiers, basic, intermediate, and advanced, right? Like advanced is someone who's killing it. They're maximizing LinkedIn and they're making the most out of the platform. Um, and then we have basic, which is, okay, the must have, right? Like you are the most socially reluctant of all, but you should at least have these things. Could you walk us through what those levels look like? What, what are the basic things you need to be doing to optimize your profile? Then you have a little bit more time. What's the intermediate? And then what does it look like when you're an advanced person making the most out of LinkedIn? And no matter how advanced you are, there's always more to learn, to do. And LinkedIn, of course, they keep changing. Changing can be good, bad, and ugly. Uh, sometimes it gives you more opportunities. Sometimes it restricts opportunities. So I would say that for a basic user, just being there, in public is a big step for them. Uh, they need to have, now ideally you have a headline that's interesting, that's more than just your job title. For some people, 
that's too much of a stretch to start. They don't want to look too different from people in their industry. So it might just be uh, their title and company and the headline. And that's okay. I start with where people are and then I kind of nudge them along a little. So having all the basic sections filled in with information, no matter how basic it is, it should always be written in first person. This is your story. You're talking about yourself, not this kind of third person. Sandra Clark is a tramp really don't care. We don't want it to look like a marketing company wrote it for you, even if they did. It's first person. And then you've got your experience at the basic level. You've got the experienced level. You might have a little bit of a description, not too much, or maybe not. For some people, they're not ready yet. Um, the skills, you've got your skills in there. You've got the first three that show in uh, are the most important. So you have those showing at the top. Uh, and you've got certifications, all of those basic sections filled in. Your education. Your education, by the way, does not need to show the dates. Uh, we want to see good university, good degree. We don't need to start calculating. Well, that means they're whole, how old if they graduate in this year. Some people like to show their age because my people who are CFOs, they love for people to know that, hey, I've been around for a while. I've seen everything. So that's your basic. Start there. You're going to not embarrass yourself, you'll be fine. Intermediate is you're going to start adding in, enriching some of it. You're going to add some more descriptions. You're going to put those skills. There's a new thing on LinkedIn, relatively new, where you can showcase certain skills under each position, it kind of pops them out, makes them look uh, more visible. You're going to uh, maybe add a little more to your about section, your, your bio. Maybe you're going to uh, be brave and add a little bit of personal information, just kind of enriching each section. You're going to add something to the featured section. Featured is great. It doesn't have to be something about you or that you wrote. It could be something about your company, um, something amazing that they're doing, that you're proud of, that they've done. And you add a little bit of color, if you like, to that middle of your profile. You add a background banner. That could be basic too, but for some people, that's a stretch. And you start enriching. And hopefully at this point, you also have a headline that is more than just your job title. Um, if you have your own business, you definitely want to have a LinkedIn company page. If for the only reason that's going to allow you to have the little logo showing next to your company name, instead of what we call the gray tombstone box, you know, it's like three little boxes there. And you've been in business for years. It does not look very professional. So that's intermediate. Advanced would be where you start to play with some of the add-on features. Uh, notice I use the word play. Definitely want to encourage people to play. And that is uh, having a profile video. Um, you can add this so that when you go to someone's profile, you notice a little moving picture for three seconds. If you click on it, it will then play for 30 seconds a little video of you talking, introducing yourself. There are many creative things you can do besides that. You've got your name pronunciation. There's a place to add that. Both the profile video and the name pronunciation have to be uploaded on your phone. Once you've uploaded them, they play on desktop and phone. But I work with people from so many cultures and their names are sometimes tough for me to say. So if I see they've done that, I feel so much more respectful if I know how to pronounce their names first. It's 10 seconds. My name's not difficult to say. Give me 10 seconds and I'm going to include a little bit of a marketing message too. So adding in those features, really making sure that headline that's 220 characters is um, adding some additional information. We all, you know, being aware of things like when you post content, you comment, we only see the first line and a half a certain number of characters. I can't remember off the top of my head. But basically, we only see part of your headline. Make sure that's the most important part to lead with when you're communicating with people. But add to the rest of it. So when you go to your profile, you've used all that space. Your featured area can be more uh, substantial. Hopefully, it's starting to have some of your content in it. There are other things. If you have your own business, there's a place to add services. There are other things you can add. If you are, uh, have openings for jobs at your company, you've got uh, a place to add that and show that you're hiring. 
So, so many things there, but most of all in that advanced level, I would say you're posting content. Um, now you're not just posting, you always, even if you're at basic or intermediate, you're starting to participate in the world of LinkedIn, you're engaging with people, you're liking and commenting and showing that you're interested. But when you're at the advanced level, you should definitely be posting. Um, you know, two or three times a week is great. And it should be posting content that's of value to your audience, not just a sales promotional pitch. Hey, I've got an FN, I'm doing this, contact me. But um, what's your thought process about something? What's important that you're uh, reading about in the news lately? What are you talking about to your colleagues? And starting to show that thought leadership. So for me, that's a differentiator for advanced is that you're showing yourself as a thought leader. And you're doing things like you put it into creator mode, which allows you to show at the top five hashtags of what it is you talk about. But most of all, you're really showing that you've got something to say out there. That's kind of my my criteria. It could be different for other trainers, but that's mine. I want to go deeper into what you were saying about the posting, Sandra. But before that, um, I just want to say that, of course, I absolutely agree with everything you're saying, because there's some people that are even using LinkedIn as landing pages. I've seen amazing profiles that people don't even have a website. They just have an amazing LinkedIn profile that has maybe like a Calendly link in, in a link to their gum road where they have their digital products and everything works. And I was just like, how smart is this that you can launch a business without a website if you use the LinkedIn profile in, in, in a great manner. Now, I want to I wanna go deeper into two elements that I think you're doing amazingly, which is photo and banner. I noticed that you have a, a little, it's almost like the, the ones that LinkedIn allows you to do. And you have it in your branded colors with, with LinkedIn guide. And that looks amazing. Um, so any thoughts on um, how that advanced person can um, maximize? I noticed some people do different colors for the border of the photo, different backgrounds with their branding to stand out. So any thoughts on how to best maximize? Like you said, we talked about the, the, the headline that follows you everywhere, but banner and photo also do. So any thoughts on how people can make the most out of those two assets? Okay, so photo and the photo, this is true for any level. Um, it should be recent, two to three years old at most. Um, it should look like you. It should look like you on a good day, not your best day, not your wedding day, your kid's wedding day. I'm sorry, you are never going to look like that again, but like you would look if you were going into a professional meeting. And then you can start getting clever with things again, and we're talking advanced here. Um, you either want it straight on. We want to see just your head neck, top of your shoulders. We want to be able to see that lovely, warm smile. We want to feel like we're going to reach across the desk to shake hands with you across the screen. You want it to pull people in to make them want to get to know you. Uh, so you start thinking about how am I communicating my brand? Now, some people culturally, a smile is not appropriate. So as you know, LinkedIn traders say, you've got to have a smile. It's like, you know, culturally, sometimes that's not true. Sometimes people have, have a client who, um, had was in a bad car accident and her mouth had been reconstructed. She was not going to smile in a picture, but she had a nice picture, looked pleasant. I think that that's enough. Um, then if you want to get clever and have some of your brand colors, as I try to do, I'm not always so clever, but I have my moments. And the photographer who did my background banner um, also took my headshot. So she, you know, had some suggestions about what I could do. So the picture is mostly to bring people in to engage them, uh, to make them want to connect with you. So if you think about that, there are little things like if you do turn slightly to one side, then make sure the photo is looking in to your profile. You want to take people's eyes into the profile, not looking away so that you uh, are saying, hey, don't look at my profile. I don't even want to look at it. You know, so little tweaks like that, you know, where you just flip the way you're looking and look into the photo, I mean, into the profile is a good start. And then um, not too much of the body. Again, I, I've said it before, but I'll say it again, just kind of the top head, neck, maybe top of the shoulders. 
And you should look like, again, for a man, you're probably not going to be wearing a, a suit and tie. Most people nowadays, maybe finance people, lawyers, perhaps. So, you know, look professional. Think about what you're wearing. Women, you know, a nice top, but not like a party dress where, you know, it's like, really? This is a, you know, um, uh, a professional site. Uh, so think about how you look. But some people, they so hate having their photo taken that I'd rather they have a photo than worry too much about it being professional. So sometimes you can get great photos going out in the backyard with some good lighting and getting uh, the photo with the camera on your phone. Just make sure it's well lit, no weird shadows, and just do it. Again, it's, people, we hate having our pictures taken. Um, I don't like it being taken, but if it's going to, I want to make sure it looks okay. And then your background banner, you can have a little fun with. If it's your own business, you definitely can have your own branded background banner. And then you want to advance things you want to think about. We are so often on our mobiles these days that you want to think, what does it look like small? So if you've got like contact information, messaging, printing, and we can't see it, don't do it. So have very little printing, make it big enough so it's visible on the mobile as well as desktop. And keep it, remember that if you do put contact information there, it's not clickable, you know, mm -hmm. can't link so you can have it there, but um, be careful about thinking that they can click. So have it branded, have your colors. If somebody doesn't, you know, have someone to do that for them, even if you go and you choose a, a free image from someplace like Pixabay or Unsplash, uh, take the picture that's maybe got a little bit of the color of your shirt or your blouse. Uh, pick something that just kind of picks it up. It shows that you're thinking about a little and we get to your profile and we've got a positive impression. So there's um, lots you can do there. Definitely with that little profile video. Mm -hmm. um, it's fun to do. And um, why not? It kind of, you know, you've got an automatic conversation starter. You know, you look at someone's little profile video uh, and I say, oh, hey, I, I saw your profile video. That was cool. I'd like to learn more. How did you do that? So, you know, do take advantage of that. Um, but yeah, people are scared of video. So that's sometimes not something they can do. That's true. And that's why the few who do it stand out, right? So if you, if you can... Uh gather the energy for sure do the video now sandra you mentioned pixabay and unsplash are there any let's get tactical for a second are there any other tools that you would recommend um for photo and banner would you recommend people to i know there's a i forgot their name but there's a company that they're doing great a great job doing um kind of like online photo shoots um and I know there's some other tools out there, but is there anything in particular that you would recommend for people to have a good photo and then have a good banner? Okay. Um, for the background banner, I'll mention one other site. I mentioned Pixabay and Unsplash. Um, the other site uh, I will mention is nappy.co, co dot not com, but co. And that has uh, great photos, much more diverse photos. Um, people of different colors, different nationalities, where Unsplash and Pixabay tend to be Caucasian centric. Um, so just, you know, be aware there's a lot of things. Be careful you do use a photo you have the rights to use. The reason I like those sites is that they are very clear that they are giving you the Creative Commons license to use it free of attribution. I think that's the expression. And um, I got fined $500 by getting images one time for using a picture in um, in a blog post of mine, I wanted something with older women for diversity, and it was hard to find, you know, so I used this image I didn't have the rights to and got fined. And that was not to continue using it. That was if I took it down right away. So I'm very careful to always tell people to be squeaky clean that you have the rights to use an image. Take one yourself or get one taken for you, if you like, for that background banner. Um, it is a long, narrow image. So be aware that some things that look beautiful as a square are not going to look good in the long, narrow banner. For headshots, I've heard of those sites where you can have it all done as an online photo shoot. I don't know them, haven't worked with any of them in particular. Um, I think the most important thing is to feel comfortable 
with the person you're working with. I'm the person that I use who doesn't do it for other people anymore. She's semi-retired, but she still will come back and do mine. Uh, we went out in a park during the COVID times because we couldn't meet inside. And we were out in nature and beautiful. She kept her distance away, but she was able to make me feel relaxed, you know, walk down this hill, let the you know breeze blow your hair or something. And by being more comfortable with her, I think it created a better image. So feel comfortable with the person that's taking that picture. If you can't, if they can't make you smile or laugh, then you probably shouldn't be working with them. Have fun with it. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. Now, Sandra, let's go deeper into the posting. When someone is beginning to post, what would you recommend as a measure of success as well as, for example, you mentioned for the bio, hey, I, just the reactions and what people tell me, right? In terms of, of posts, what would, because I think there's an initial when you haven't posted, you start posting and you get like big reactions and then um, it starts to die down. Um, so what are some of the recommendations you would give to someone who's getting started in terms of having um, the right expectations and the right measures of success? Yeah, I, I love that question because my measures are a little different than other people. There are measurements that LinkedIn gives you, how many views of your post. Now views, I wanna be sure to point out that does not mean the number of people who saw it. That means the number of people who might've seen it if they've been looking at their newsfeed at that time. So it's, it's a measurement. Is it the most important measurement? No. And so it's something you pay attention to. Uh, I call views LinkedIn's love for you. It means they pushed it out and people have liked, commented, and then LinkedIn has spread it out even further. So number of views is a, a factor to look at. Then engagement is much more important. People who liked it or reacted to it, since there's a number of ways you can react, um, people who commented on it, because when they do that, it's now shared into part of their newsfeed and goes to their people. So you're now getting two and three degrees away from your original set of connections. They um, give you the opportunity if they comment for you to comment back. And now you're starting a conversation, which is great for business development, for getting to know each other. So those are all uh, measurements. Uh, there are some different things in that video, for example, the number of views is measured differently. Uh, it's measured by if somebody pauses for at least three seconds where your video is, that counts as a view, which is more valuable than just appearing in someone's newsfeed. Um, so videos are important. Make sure you've got captions on them for many reasons, but also it'll stop the scroll for at least three seconds. So those are kind of generally measurements. For me, a lot of it is I don't feel the need to reach everyone. Okay, if I get a post that kind of goes semi-viral and spreads widely, it's exciting, it's fun. But I really only need to reach the one or two people that need to hear my message and are interested in working with me. So for me, if I get someone contact me for a consultation, they, they say, they, how did you hear about me? And they say, well, I saw a post you wrote. That's a measurement. So I, I'm always going to track that. They often don't remember what post it was. Um, but the fact that they saw it, a lot of time people, especially my people, the socially reluctant, they will watch their lurkers. They will look for a long, long time before they ever engage with you. They may never react, like comment before they contact me because, you know, it's like that's too overwhelming, but they're looking. So how can I measure those people that are looking and not connecting with me? Uh, I can't, but I, you know, my business kind of sustains itself. So presumably they're getting my message, but that's um, just getting started. So I kind of, so those are measurements. And then obviously if you get business from it, that's mm -hmm. a real measurement, but that's, um, that's hard to evaluate. Um, and I, you know, I get business. Do I do I know that I got that business from that post? No, not necessarily. It's all those cumulative things that 
people will say things like, well, I just always see you online. I'm actually not online posting that that much, but I'm steady enough that they see it, that it, you know, they feel aware of me. So those are all measurements. There are things, if we're in that advanced category again, where there are different types of posts that are more effective is not quite the right word because you might do a, a post that reached one person um, and it's a great client, so that's enough. But when you do a post, if you're just getting started, so this is, well, what's the best kind of post to do? And my answer is the kind of post that you're willing to do. So a link post, for example, a link to an, an article you read that you thought was great. Now, in LinkedIn terms, that's not a great post to do. LinkedIn mm -hmm. doesn't have links very much, so it tends to not spread it widely. But hey, yay, you've done it. You've got to start. Uh, now, you want to ideally at least put some thought about why you shared that post, why people should read it, and not something like, oh, here's a great post. Oh, you should read this post just because you told me. But, you know, a comment about if you look at the top three reasons people say you should do this as a manager, you're going to be much more successful in your work. May me want to read it. And you're also adding your thought leadership. So link posts, if it gets you started, if you do it, I have one client. I've never been able to get her to post anything original, but she adds some very nice thoughtful comments to the links. And she's actually had great engagement with that. Um, a text post or a text with an image um, do very well. The image kind of stops you and then we read what you've written. So an image post might do very well. People like on, but they're not gonna comment on it. You know, what do you comment on a pretty picture? It'll go far, a lot of people will see it um, and maybe you get a lot of reactions but you're not getting the chance to engage. So picture, I like that text with it too, or even text on its own. Uh, some people do things like they add some emojis to their text to sort of stop the eye. I'm not a huge fan of emojis in general, but it works for people. So you've got those kinds of posts, you've got document posts, videos, if you're willing to do it. If you really wanna up your game, you've absolutely got to be doing video. Uh, and people go, no, it's worse than having my picture taking. <laughs> but um, video posts, always with captions. They don't have to be fancy or formal. You're just sharing yourself, your personality, especially now with all this AI. People, you know, you can have things written by artificial intelligence. And I've tried it out. It's pretty good often. You know, if you're there in person in video, you know it's me. I'm not a robot. So um, video is great. So there's always more you can do. There's 10 or 11 different kinds of posts you can do. I used to have a group posting program where I would teach people all the different kinds of posts. And then I learned that they just were not going to do the different kinds. Mm. So I focus on what are the two or three that you're willing to do and then just do it consistently. Uh, what kinds of posts do you do? Is there a mix? We do, we do a little bit of everything. We try to do a little bit of just text. Um, we haven't done the image that much. We do um, the file, the the document. Those do really well. The carousel post, and we do a ton of video because of every one of these podcast conversations. We cut it into short mini videos, and then we share those. And that's a that's a simple way to to share content. Now, Sandra, is there? How would you? how would you coach people to go about the mix? Because I think you have some great points there about, hey, there might be some posts, like a pretty photo, everybody engages, it goes semi-viral. That's good for reach. But then you have these other posts that maybe one or two people like it or nobody likes it, but those are the ones that actually get you business. And we want to have that balance connecting it back to what you said about the bio is that, yeah, I want to make sure that people know how I can help them but I've learned that sharing a little bit of my journey in, in my life helps create that connection and it helps create trust. So what are some good rules of thumb for people to have in mind um, whenever they start posting? I like the one that, hey, do the ones you feel comfortable with. Don't try to do everything. I, I think that's a great one. Any others that come to mind that are just like quick, 
good rules of thumb for people to have in mind when they start posting. Okay, I will come back to that, but I just have to circle back slightly to give you slightly a hard time about something that you said. <laughs> Absolutely, please do. And when I asked you, what do you post? You immediately went to, we post. And so for me, you were hiding behind your brand, your company a little. And I, and I, most people on LinkedIn don't really care about your company until they care about you. So when you're posting, you're showing you who you are, what matters to you, what's important. Now we're intrigued. Okay, now I want to learn about the company. So I know that, you know, that was just kind of, you know, where you went, but I have to tease you slightly because that is something that people do. They hide behind the brand. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a, that's a great point. And you know, I do post in my account. I say we, because I don't want to take the credit. I don't do the videos. We have a, a, a great team of videographers and I don't do the, the, the designs and the, the document post we work as a team. So I think my mind directly went we, because I know it's not me, but it, in terms of posting it, it comes all out. We actually decided to stop posting on the company page because that doesn't generate as much traction as if I post and make it conversationally. So uh, thank you, number one, for the hard time because uh, I'm all for receiving feedback and growing. Uh, and I absolutely agree with it that it's way better to post as a human than as a company. Right. And, you know, you have this great team supporting you. You're lucky most people don't or many people don't. Uh, but if it's you, if it's the video, if it's you talking, that's you. They are the team that make you look good with the technology, with the pretty design, but it is still you. Um, <laughs> so, um, and also to mention the company page, um, don't discount it. People don't engage on your company page, but they do look to validate, to see credibility. So I can't tell you how many people I know who have company pages don't see any engagement. But somebody will reach out to them and say, oh, you know, can you help me? It's just like, and they've never had any interaction with them. But they said, oh, I, I looked at your company page and saw this. So, you know, don't discount it. You don't want to spend a lot of time there, maybe. But there is definitely value in that. And it's easy to post in both places. But now having turned things back to ask you the question and put you in the hotspot, I have forgotten the question you were leading me to. <laughs> so the question was how to... What are some good rules of thumb to know that you're doing a good job, right? We talked about yeah, post what about comes, it. post what comes easy to you. Um, we have we have a couple other ones on on that uh, teachable moment. Uh, make sure that you're leveraging your personal profile. Also, don't discount the the company page. Uh, maybe not put the majority of the efforts, but put something out there so that people when people go there. They don't think your company is uh, not in business anymore because the last post was like five years ago or something like that. Uh, any any other uh, good rules of thumb so that when people are asking themselves, well, what what should I be doing? They can kind of like go to these um, rules of thumb. Okay, so the first thing that comes to mind is stop the scroll. People are scrolling through, my goodness, especially on the phone. They're scrolling through you want to stop them and you want to stop them visually, but then you also want to stop them to hopefully make them click on see more and read. So you do that partly, you know, you can use images to do that. You can use video with captions to do that. But even in what you write, there's only the first few lines that show of your text. So there are ways that people get very, I don't call it sneaky in what they show in the first couple of lines. And then they've got a bunch of spaces to kind of force you, you know, to open. But those first couple of lines you want in something intriguing that makes people want to click on more and see what it's all about. Something engaging that pulls me in. It's just like, I want to know what you're saying about this, because I think I've got an opinion about this. Um, and so once you grab them, it's a bit like we nowadays always have to think of everything with a marketing brain. It's like, What's quick, what pulls us in, then we give them a little more, and then we give them some additional meat. So that first part is critical, what kind of post it is. There is the, um, we don't like blocks of text. It's too hard to read. So you want to break it up. Uh, you can use some emojis, um, if that's your thing, helping to break it up. 
but you don't have to. Space, white space is magic. Not too long a sentence. Um, ideally, not at too high a level. I've, I've got some clients and they're like super, super smart. And that smartness comes out in a vocabulary that's at the advanced university level. It's hard to read. It's hard to understand. So simplify it down to make it easy to read and accessible and add something that's going to bring people into the conversation. You know, you can have a question. Um, you might have a challenging statement that I read that and I immediately want to disagree with you or add something to it. So do things. It's not just about, hey, I think this, this is the best thing. But what do you think? I'd love to hear your opinion too. bring them into the conversation. I think the more that you can do that, the more successful you'll be on LinkedIn with your posts. Now, Sandra, let's say someone is listening to this and um, they listen to this. They put all this advice um, into work. They uh, read a bunch of different posts, watch a bunch of different videos, maximize the, all the free tools that are available out there. Uh, Pixabay, Canva, et cetera. And they now understand that there's a ton of value in LinkedIn and doing it the right way. And they understand that there's room for growth. So this is people who are ready to invest in their LinkedIn presence. What would you tell them in terms of the, the range of what that investment can represent in terms of time and money? Let's say, well, the minimum is... I don't know, get this um, video program and invest in a photo shoot, invest in X, Y, and C, and you're going to have to put this many hours per week and that's going to be this much. And the top range would be like hire a coach, hire a consultant, hire a copywriting team. Like on the average, what is it that you see out there that are good ranges to keep in mind in terms of the amount of money that you should be investing on LinkedIn? and the amount of time that it's going to be required, depending on how much money you're investing. Okay. Well, of course, I have to say the obvious thing is depends on what you want to get out of it. You know, so if you want to go online, there are tons of videos on how to do things better on LinkedIn and other articles. Just be careful because LinkedIn changes all the time. When you do a search for how do I do this, make sure you include the year, you know, uh, because of all the changes, you might find something and it's really good, but it was a year ago and it doesn't have the new stuff on LinkedIn. They did over a hundred changes last year alone. They went a little crazy. So uh, if you're going to look, but that is more time. So if time is money to you and you want to do it quickly, then it's worth investing uh, with a LinkedIn coach or someone who's going to help you do that more quickly. It's a little less painful. Um, there are people that write your profiles for them. I don't do that. Um, that's a higher investment. And it still takes time because you've got to give that person enough time, enough information for them to write it. Then you've got to review it. So I don't know that it saves a whole lot of time, but there is that option. So what do you want to get out of it is where you need to start with. I have people, it's like, well, I, they say, well, how much time do I need to spend on it? So I have a, a baseline of engagement, which is what I call three to five fruits and veggies per day. You know, we're supposed to, for good health, have three to five fruits and veggies. So I say on LinkedIn, you want to do at least three likes, two comments per day. And for a lot of my people, that's a stretch. For some people, they say, oh, that's too simple. That's not good. It's better to do all the commenting. But I start with where people are and kind of nudge them along. So that kind of activity can take very short amount of time. Uh, sometimes I work with an executive and they'll say, I just don't have time to do this. Um, I said, well, how much time can you give me? Can you give me half an hour? No, no, I don't have 15 minutes. Mm, this is 10 minutes. Okay, 10 minutes. So what I do a lot of time, you know, people get on social media and they go down a rabbit hole, they spend too long on it. And then the next day they say, I can't do that. I just can't spare the time. So what I'll do with my execs who are worried about that is to say, set a timer. 10 minutes is all you're going to spend it in. I want you to spend 10 minutes, do what you can, and then step away. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of cute because I'll sometimes get them email me and says, Sandra, I did just 10 minutes, but I stepped away and I came back every day to do it. And um, so um, you can do things in as little as 10 to 15 minutes a day. 
Um, you divide up that time by the three to five likes and comments. You connect with a couple of people. You respond to a couple of people. Now, you're not going to be able to post in that amount of time. But if you're on LinkedIn for business development um, or for a, as a job seeker, it's however you're, say you're marketing your business. Most small business owners, for example, they're going to spend maybe a third of their time marketing. So if you're looking, well, they don't work 40 hour weeks. Let's say they work 60 hour weeks. So a third of that, 20 hours. And then of their marketing time, how much of the 20 hours are they, do they think it's worth giving to LinkedIn? So they think, you know, I think LinkedIn is worth it. Um, so I'm going to spend half of that's 15 hours. So divide your 15 hours out through the week. And that's how much time you have each day. And that's going to consist of finding your target clients to connect to, um, engaging with other people's posts, um, writing your own content, um, and other activities on LinkedIn. So, you know, what are you willing to do and what do you want to get out of it? If you're someone who just wants to be seen as a thought leader and you, you write content, but you write that content for a blog and you're going to just also put it on LinkedIn, you know, you can multitask, multitask or multipurpose it uh, and have it in, it takes longer to write, um, but, you know, you get more value out of it. Unfortunately, writing long, thoughtful things don't necessarily do well on LinkedIn in terms of reach, but it does show your thought leadership. If we go to your profile, we can see it. And that's also um, indexed by Google. So it's searchable on Google as well. So it is worth doing. If you're also using it somewhere else, I wouldn't recommend somebody start writing long articles just for LinkedIn. Um, you won't necessarily get the real value out of it, but it is worth putting it there if you're also using it somewhere else. So, you know, sometimes I'll say, how much time are you willing to spend and what do you get out of it? And then we balance those two and come up with a, a formula of both what to do and how long to do it for. And then on the other side of that, Sandra, let's say, okay, someone tells you, I am, I'm going to do it. I'm going to invest time and money because I totally see the value. And a typical question would be the ROI. So how do you set expectations? What should people be expecting when they make that investment in terms of the results and the timeline? We know um, that sometimes at the beginning, you might have a good results because of, of the algorithm, but then that changes. So when you're working with people, what are, what are good expectations and milestones whenever they get started in this LinkedIn, investing in the LinkedIn journey? Okay. Um, I tend to work with people in short periods of time. We'll do like their profile makeover. We might work for a few months together to do posting content, but I'm not usually working with them over a long period of time. So it's hard for me to measure or unless they get back to me and tell me to know what the success is. But I would say you need to be in it for the long haul. Uh, it's not an overnight success kind of thing. I mean, it might be if you're a job seeker, perhaps, but even then, not, not nowadays. But you need to see that it's for the long term. And it's a bit like building relationships with people. You know, if you just meet someone one time and you say, okay, well, they never did anything for me. Well, have you stayed in touch with them? You know, if you build your network over time, like I usually recommend people have at least 30 connections for every year of their age as a baseline. And that does not, by the way, mean I'm over 200 years old. Well, some days I feel it. But um, the idea being that you meet at least 30 people professionally a year. Why not connect with them on LinkedIn? And if you do that throughout your career, you will have them when you need them. Maybe you need a new employee with a specialized skill set. Maybe you want to. Um, I work with a lot of people who are getting towards the end of their regular career, but they want to get on boards. Um, and that's what they want to do in the future. So now they've built this network over time and that network is there for them, but you have to stay in touch. That staying in touch might be as simple as sending them a birthday greeting, sending them a congratulations. Um, it might be commenting on something they've posted. Um, you know, you might have something where you make a target list of people you particularly want to stay in touch with 
and you just have it on your calendar to, you know, once a month, just ping them or do something to stay in touch. So for me, you know, the people I'm working with and the way I work, and because I don't get to hear the results too often, it's just, you've got to be in it for the long haul. And you've got to think about what is the value you want to get from it. I love the fact that I know what companies my clients have moved on to when they get a new job. I love that they've moved to a different country and that they're growing their business there or that they've published a book. I work with a lot of coaches, a lot of executive coaches, and I get to see them developing new programs. And uh, one is working as she's doing, offering her program in resorts and Bali and places to go. Um, And it's just fun to watch them succeed. So I don't know, I don't have a hard and fast do this and you will get this out of it. It's more like, um, I think it's worth it. Um, I have my daughter years ago was contacted by a recruiter. She wasn't interested in the job, but her one of her close friends was. So she introduced the recruiter to her friend. So my daughter's now the hero. So mm-hmm. you don't know how you're going to use the network. Am I going to introduce somebody to you who will be a next podcast guest? Do I... Um, you know, can I help you find your an, another vendor that would be useful to you? You know, I don't really look in, okay, I put this much in and I expect to get that much out. I just kind of don't live life that way. I kind of like to put it out to the universe and the universe is pretty generous. It does give it back to me. That's a great point, Sandra. Whoever plays the longest game is whoever going to have the chance to, to win bigger at the end, right? So, um, I, I absolutely agree with those points. And we've talked about profile optimization, videos, posting, and growing your business, taking your career to different levels. And I'm curious, Sandra, when people ask you, what do you do? What is your typical answer? <laughs> okay. Besides giving people a hard time. <laughs> so I tell people that what I primarily do is a two-hour makeover session where we go over the profile from top to bottom to map to your current goals. Those goals are gonna vary, but we make sure they're all in alignment with what you want now. I record that session so people, whatever their learning style, if they need to go back and quietly listen, they can do that. If they wanna share with an administrative assistant, they can do that too. And then I remain available for a couple of weeks by email to answer any questions because I don't know about you, but the the moment I walk out of training, I'm thinking, darn, I wish I'd asked that question. Did she mean? I'm not sure. So I want to remain available. I am a teacher at heart. And once a teacher, always a teacher, you can't get get it out of us. And so I stay available by email to answer those questions or maybe send a little video. And then I come back together with people for a half hour kind of accountability session. And okay, what's your strategy? Where do you go from here? And I stick around for a little while too by email after that, because I want people to it, be encouraged, supported to keep using it, not just do it. I've got a good profile and now I'm going to walk away from it. So that's the majority of what I do. You know, profile optimization, we can call it that. Um, a lot of it for me is making people feel confident to use LinkedIn themselves and know that they can do these things and nothing terrible is going to happen. You click that button, the world is not going to end. You know, you do a drop down, you accidentally post something you didn't mean to. It's okay, you can delete it. (laughs) It's not a problem. I have other things. You know, I do work with people longer term for posting. um, Mm -hmm. But um, the bigger part is just getting the profile, looking good and making people feel confident to use it. So that was kind of a long winded answer, I guess, on what it is I do. Uh, And I usually mention the social media for the socially reluctant. So they go, okay, this is a safe place. So for anybody out there listening, is there anyone in particular that that you feel it's a best fit for you? You have a great, that great descriptor of the socially reluctant, which I love. But is there any any other um, ways in which we can think about? Is it people that have their own business? Is it people that want to transition and keep growing as an employee and and grow their careers and any particular profile that comes to mind that you think is the best fit for what you do? I love working with coaches. I actually took an executive coaching program one time thinking I might become a coach. And what I learned is coaches are supposed to ask the question and then 
sit back and wait for you to find the answer. And I realized I kept wanting to put my consultant hat on and say, well, let's just get it done together. But I learned to admire them greatly with what they do. So they're they're fun to work with. And um, so coaches in particular, small business owners are often so busy running the business, they don't have time to focus and think about doing this. Um, thought leaders of a call, I work with a lot of kind of CFOs and people in that kind of level where they, they want to be seen as a thought leader and they want to attract people to apply to work at their companies and be somebody that you'd want to work for. So that kind of, and people in that um, director, manager level where they know they need to look good on LinkedIn, but they want some help doing it. Um, so I would say those are kind of, I do work with some job seekers. Usually they're what I call stealth job seekers. They are employed, they have a good job, but they kind of want to look at something else there and they don't want their employer to know. So I have ways of helping them without it being, you know, very visible that they're looking. So there's kind of thought leaders, stealth job seekers, and small business owners, more coaches than service providers are kind of maybe the three areas that I mostly work with. Sandra, we've covered a lot. There are many great strategic and tactical actional insights in, in everything we discuss, is there anything else that you would like to share with the audience? We'll link to your uh, page and your LinkedIn profile, but is there anything else in particular that you would like to share with the audience? I really just would like to encourage people to try, actually not try to do, just getting started uh, can be overwhelming, but uh, it will reward you um, in both the connections you make and in um, this, how successful you look online. So just do it. Don't overthink it. I work with a lot of perfectionists, overthinkers. And so I have to keep telling them, stop it. <laughs> Don't overthink, just do it and get started. It will pay off. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a great closing message. Stop overthinking and just do it. So thank you very much, Sandra. This was a magnificent conversation just for me personally and hopefully for everybody out there. And for everybody out there listening, thank you so much for being here with us and we'll see you in the next episode.